I'm in Singapore and I'm about to go on stage in just a few minutes. I have not given a presentation for over a year now. I was in a little fender bender a while back and so I took a little bit of time off. There's this sense of urgency now. The global dollar standard was put in place by a series of accidental events that were very fortunate for the United States because it gave us an advantage over the rest of the world. But our politicians over the past decade or so have abused this privilege as though it was their birthright. And now the rest of the world are turning their backs on the U.S. dollar standard. This is going to cause a financial calamity the likes of which we've never seen before, and it's going to be devastating for most people. I don't want this to happen, but the damage has already been done. So I'm going around trying to alert people and show them how they can protect themselves and turn this into a great opportunity for themselves. So there's always one result from what we are doing right now, expanding the currency supplies all over the planet. There's one result, and that is higher gold and silver prices. I love America, at least the America that the Founding Fathers created, and I'm hoping that people get interested in this so that they'll see that what made America great is the answer to our problems, to get back to free markets, free people, and sound money. Our own history proves that this is the road to maximum prosperity. We are entering a period of financial crisis that is the greatest the world has ever known. The wealth transfer that will take place during this decade is the greatest wealth transfer in history. Wealth is never destroyed, it is merely transferred, and that means that on the opposite side of every crisis there is an opportunity. The great news is that all you have to do to turn this crisis into your great opportunity is to educate yourself. I believe that the best investment that you can make in your lifetime is your own education education on the history of money, education on finance, education on how the global economy works, education on how all of these guys, the central bankers, the stock market, how they can cheat you, how they can scam you. If you learn what is going on and how the financial world works, you can put yourself on the correct side of this wealth transfer. Winston Churchill once said, that the further you look into the past, the further that you can see into the future. This program is all about creating your own crystal ball, being able to gaze into the future, being able to change this crisis, the greatest crisis in the history of mankind, into your great opportunity. I was born in Salem, Oregon in 1956, and we moved to California when I was four years old in 1960. But <clears throat> when I went to school, uh, it was obvious after uh, just the uh, fourth grade that there was something different with me. And by fifth grade, I was in remedial classes, and it turned out that I was dyslexic, and teachers were not taught to recognize that back then. I was always falling behind everyone else. Uh, when I would get a teacher that would uh, lecture instead of making us read out of books, I would just absolutely excel. I suddenly went from the dumbest kid in class to the smartest kid in all of the periods of that class. But uh, the result was that, um, you know, after a while I was in every single remedial class and I just couldn't take it. Uh, and in 10th grade, I dropped out, middle of 10th grade, and I've never been back to school. I often say that in every crisis there's an opportunity, and in this case, uh, it, the handicap of dyslexia has also been a blessing. Because I couldn't learn out of books, and I couldn't take notes, I just had to remember everything. And I have the ability to, uh, my brain's wired a little bit differently, I have the ability to uh, look at a chart uh, today, and I know how it relates to a chart that I saw 10 years ago. But it was back in about the year 2000 when Steve Jobs of Apple introduced OS X. The world of books opened up to me, built right into the operating system, was a text-to-speech program. Now I could just have an assistant slice and scan my books and turn them into text and email me, and then all I have to do 
is highlight the text, press a button, and the computer reads to me. People are turning to assets that will keep their value if prices rise. So much money has been pumped into the system that people are worried about inflation down the road, said Bruno S. Fry, professor of economics at the University of Zurich. So dyslexia is no longer a problem. But what it's also done for me is I have the ability to explain complex things to people in a simple manner for some reason. And so I sort of made it my mission uh, to try and wake up the middle class, to let them know how the monetary system works, to let them know that there is a major economic calamity coming sometime down the road. And it's most likely within this decade that we're in right now. The U.S. dollar is about 60% of the value of all the currency on the planet, and more than half of the dollars reside outside the United States. The reason they, uh, every country has U.S. dollars is, first of all, that's what central banks use as a reserve currency. Second of all, oil is priced in dollars. And then, if we put this on a timeline, here's the nails in the coffin for the dollar standard, and you will see there's not a lot of time left. This is my evidence that I think is proof that the death of the dollar is coming and it's coming shortly. Nixon ended Bretton Woods and we went on the dollar standard. Then the first nail in the coffin is Iraq sells oil in euros. The crisis of 2008 and we added 1.25 trillion to our base money in the United States. As we add to the base currency, people get worried about inflation, they start rushing toward gold and silver. Iran ends oil sales in dollars, and they're taking commodities in trade for oil, they're taking, uh, in Turkey, they take the local currency and then buy gold in Turkey and export the gold to Iran, so they're basically selling oil for gold. They do the same thing with India. QE2, quantitative easing, that's uh, more currency printing in the United States. Libya, China and Russia bypassed the dollar. They did a bilateral trade agreement where they uh, hold each other's currency and they do direct debt settlement without having to wire transfer U.S. dollars. The Chinese president just recently said that the uh, dollar as the world's reserve currency is a product of the past. Utah recognized silver and gold as money. China and Iran bypass the U.S. dollar with a bilateral trade agreement. Venezuela repatriates its gold. China and Japan trade directly. India and Japan bypass the U.S. dollar. Russia and Iran trade directly. Iran sells India oil for rupees and commodities. China and Brazil trade directly. Swiss citizens demand gold repatriation. African countries ban the dollar. In Zambia, you can go to jail if you use U.S. dollars. <laughs> Uh, quantitative easing number three. They have announced at the Federal Reserve that they're going to be, they're starting with $40 billion of currency that they're creating each month, and now it jumps to $85 billion. That's more than one trillion a year. And remember, it took 200 years to go from no dollars to 825 billion, and now they're going to create a trillion every year. Iran trading energy for gold. Singapore removes tax on money. Germany repatriates 150 tons of gold from the New York Fed. The citizens of Netherlands demand gold repatriation. Ecuador repatriates part of its gold reserves. Austrian citizens demanding gold repatriation. China acknowledges fundamental market shortage of gold. And now, the Fed is increasing the rate of printing. I said from 40 to 85 billion every month, just over a trillion per year. So those are the nails in the coffin for the dollar standard. And if you noticed, they're all speeding up and they're all happening right now. You don't have a whole lot of time. And if you wait too long, then the opportunity is gone. It's gonna fail. Why is the dollar sacrosanct? Why is it not gonna happen to the US dollar? What will? People think, oh no, it's high technology, or we have computers now, or the internet. And these are ridiculous arguments. The truth is, all fiat currencies have failed, and there's no reason why this one won't. What worries me again so much is that it's a global situation. And so it's going to cause problems on a global basis. And it's a trust breaking down. And you're already seeing the trust breaking down, as I said earlier, because you're seeing different countries exchange directly with each other's currencies, circumventing the dollar 
You're seeing that in oil. You're going to see it more and more, and people are just going to opt out of the dollar. And you'll probably get to a point before the whole thing collapses entirely where the dollar is more or less used internally in the United States and externally is not used as much because there'll be a lot of uh, agreements made between nation states outside of the United States that will want to use each other's currency and not the dollar. This isn't going to be pretty when it happens. I am not an end-of-worlder or a doomsday guy. All you can do is play the hand that you are dealt. If we go to a new monetary system, and I think it's absolutely inevitable, uh, there's just too much energy built up in, in this one that has to release. It has to come crashing down somehow. Uh, when that happens, there's an enormous wealth transfer uh, for people that are on one side of the bet or another. And people don't realize that whether they, are, they think they are making a bet or not, they are making the bet. Uh, they are involved. This wealth transfer affects everybody whether you want to participate or not. If you're holding paper assets uh, and uh, paper currencies, you have bet one direction. If you're holding gold and, and physical assets, you've bet the opposite direction. So these are changes in Chinese holdings. They are accumulating gold. They are getting rid of U.S. Treasury bonds. This is gold held in China. The green line is the cumulative gold that's on this side, this scale. So it's gone from about 700 tons to almost 6,000 tons just since the year 2000. So this is their central bank holdings. This is their mine, mine supply. But this is, and my researcher put all of this data together. You're the first people to see this. This is the amount of uh, gold flowing through the Hong Kong exchange that goes into China. And the past couple of years here, they have ramped up their buying. They know that the dollar standard is coming to an end. And they are protecting themselves. And you're probably going to see gold-backed renminbi someday, the yuan. So <clears throat> this is an interesting chart. Uh, change in global influence. So this is the correlation to this basket of currencies. This basket of currencies, if you add them all up, they're trading up or they're trading down. And this was pre-crisis, so it's before 2008. So this is from the International Monetary Fund. It's their data. So from 2005 to 2008, this is the correlation of, you know, if that basket of currencies was trading up, the dollar was probably doing about the same thing as what it's saying. The Chinese renminbi, a little less so. And then, this is today. The U.S. dollar is done for. I don't think there's any question we're heading for a new monetary system. The question is what will it consist of? You know, the four choices are sort of a, res a world of multiple reserve currencies. And Barry Eichengreen, uh, Berkeley, is the leading proponent of this, or leading uh, a scholar on this topic. The problem with that, and where I disagree with Ike and Green, is there's no anchor in that system. We did have multiple reserve currencies before in the 1920s, he's right about that, and it was sterling and the dollar, but they were both anchored to gold. And in the post uh, Bretton Woods world, since 1944, it's been one reserve currency, which is the anchor, and it was anchored to gold until 1971. Since then, the dollar has been detached from gold, but all the other currencies are still linked to the dollar. So at the end of the day, we've had an anchor of some kind. We've never had a world of multiple reserve currencies with no anchor. I'm not sure that's that stable. The SDR is the second choice. The SDR is a basket currency sponsored by the IMF. Uh, at least for the time being, it's also printed money. The, the IMF literally prints the SDRs and ships them out to the members, and their reserves go up, exactly the way the Fed creates money and, and bank reserves go up. Uh, but it's not backed by anything. Third choice is gold, some variation on the gold standard. Uh, and the fourth choice is uh, what I call chaos, which is that nobody does anything. There's a lot of wishful thinking. There's a lot of denial. There's a lot of delay. And we get to the point where people just totally lose faith in paper currencies, go to hard assets, and we have a sequential collapse of paper currencies around the world, at which point governments will have to react with emergency measures. And that could include coercion, confiscation, um, you know, various sorts of freezes on paper assets. It could be a lot of things in that scenario. So uh, to me, it's multiple reserve currencies. SDR is gold or chaos. Um, I favor gold, but I fear that we may get chaos.
I've talked about every 30 to 40 years the world has a new monetary system. And the thing is that over the years, governments and, these central, and the banks have basically screwed us more and more and more. Uh, and these new currency systems are always created by the same idiots that created the last one that fell apart. It's the big banks, it's the central banks, and it's governments that are creating these new systems each time. And each time, the system they come up with is a system that cheats the population more and enriches the government and the banks more. It's a system that transfers wealth uh, at greater and greater speeds. You know, this one is going to fall apart just like all of the others. Uh, there's a difference this time, though. There's the Internet. People are connected all over the world. Information is spreading and people are getting educated. So I'm hoping that we go back to gold. Not a gold standard. Gold standards suck. <laughs> I did a video on that. With a gold standard, uh, there's supposed to be a certain amount of gold in the vaults for each unit of currency. In other words, it's a one-to-one -one ratio is the way that it started. And then they print more receipts than gold that exists. So if we have gold standards, we're going to get scammed again. If we used gold and silver, if the public gets educated enough before all of this happens, if we went back to gold and silver, then governments can't scam us. It limits uh, their ability to transfer wealth from the population to the government and to the banks. A lot of people say that you can't use gold and silver today because they're too heavy and bulky and it's completely wrong. You could put gold and silver in a vault and you could make payments to somebody by transferring ownership of nanograms, grams or ounces of gold and silver from one person's account to another by means of a check, a credit card or even your cell phone. If we go back to a gold-backed currency, gold-backed U.S. dollar, at that point, I think the minimum scam <laughs> that the U.S. could get away with, which means the minimum number of dollars in existence that they could make convertible into gold, would be the dollars that are held in foreign central banks. That would be similar to the Bretton Woods system that we had from 1944 to 71. Well, I did some analysis on this when I was writing the book back in 2005, and back then it required $20,000 an ounce gold for the Treasury to have enough gold to cover those dollars, or the New York Fed, actually. And if they were going to back all of the dollars, you're talking gold measured in the hundreds of thousands of dollars per ounce. There just isn't that much gold, and there's a whole lot of currency. We keep on printing it every minute of every day. This is gold and how it accounts for a currency supply. This is our base money in the United States, which was gold back here from 1900 until the Federal Reserve. The amount of currency in circulation in gold were the same. And then we established the Federal Reserve and, and we inflated for World War I, and we had more currency in circulation than we had gold to back it. There were some bank runs in the 30s, then Roosevelt unpegged the dollar from gold and gold's value rose from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce and when it did the value of the gold held at the US Treasury rose to meet the value of all the currency that was printed in the meantime. Here's the same chart again but now I'm taking it out to 1971 and what you see is these gold inflows during World War I during World War II, it's another 117% uh, gold increase. This is what made the United States a superpower. It's all financial. It isn't our war machine necessarily. It's, it's all the gold inflows that we got because everybody else was at war and we were isolated from it. And they had to pay us for all their consumer goods and so on. And then we jumped into the war and we inflated. And then in about 1959, countries started figuring out that we didn't have all the gold, you know, we were printing more dollars than gold that we had to back it, and under the Bretton Woods system, they could go to the New York Fed and turn in their dollars for gold at $35 per ounce, only foreign central banks. Individuals couldn't do that. 
Uh, so gold started flowing out, and the U.S. lost 50% of its gold from 59 to 71. And in the meantime, we kept on printing currency. If this had continued until it got down to zero, if there was one more dollar out there that laid claim to gold, that came in and said, we want our gold for a currency, and there was no gold to back it up, the entire world monetary system would have come crashing down. So Nixon had to take us off of the Bretton Woods system, the last vestiges of the gold standard in August 15th of 71. So here's the same chart again. Uh, there's the first chart and the second chart to 71, and now I'm taking it out to 85, and I'm adding a second line here. How many, how many people would agree that credit cards are replacing cash in circulation? Yeah? Credit cards, you use your credit card more and more every year, right? You use cash less and less. Well, this is outstanding credit card balances. It's called Re revolving credit outstanding is the name of the chart that you get from the Federal Reserve. When you charge something on a credit card, you create currency. Uh, the bank didn't actually loan you anything. They invented numbers. And then they have the gall to charge you interest if you don't pay those numbers back on time. <laughs> but uh, so the thing is that the merchant that you're paying, the restaurant or the grocery store, that merchant's checking account can't tell the difference between the credit dollars that you created or the cash dollars that you pay them. So to that merchant's checking account, it all looks the same. And those dollars that you created stay in circulation until somebody saves them up and pays down credit card debt. So unpaid credit card balances I include as part of the cash in circulation. And in 1971, Nixon took us off the gold standard and gold became a freely traded separate commodity slash money. And it did an accounting of the currency supply. There was quite a while here where we could have gone back on the gold standard. The value of the gold at the Treasury exceeded all the dollars printed from George Washington to Jimmy Carter. And for a week or so, a couple of weeks, it uh, exceeded out base money plus outstanding revolving credit. So here's the same chart again. That was to 1985, and now I'm going to take it out to today. And so there's that 1980 peak where it shot past base money and base money plus outstanding revolving credit. And then we get to the crisis of 08. And uh, Ben Bernanke, oh, by the way, instead of billions, we're now measuring in trillions. So we started in millions, and then it went to billions, and now it's trillions. So we did the bailouts and all the quantitative easings, and that's what the currency supply looks like today. And then they announced quantitative easing three which is that $85 billion a month that they're creating, and they think they're going to have to do it until about 2015. So here's the projection for gold covering the currency supply today would be $13,400 per ounce gold for history to repeat and for gold to do the same thing that it did in 1934 and in 1980. And believe me, it shocked people in, 19, in the 1970s. When gold was $35 an ounce and Nixon took us off the Bretton Woods system, all the economists were predicting that gold was going to go down because now there was going to be no more monetary demand for it. Anybody that said gold was going to go to 100 bucks was considered an absolute lunatic, and it went to 850 It rose 24 times its price. Well, when I wrote my book, we were right here with base money. So base money plus outstanding revolving credit. It took about $6,000 an ounce for history to repeat. Today it takes 13400 And if you include the same overshoot, remember in 1980 it didn't just cover base money, but it shot past it. $24,000 an ounce gold is what it would require to meet that. Except we've, the Fed has announced that they're going to keep on printing currency until there's lower unemployment and the economy gets back on track. And they think till 2015. So the projected price, according to the Fed and history repeating, if, that was to, if, if the Fed does this and then history repeats and gold, the, the public gets afraid of what the Federal Reserve is doing and they rush toward gold and silver to protect their purchasing power, gold would have to rise from there to way up here, and that is $26,000 per ounce gold to cover. 
If it does the same overshoot, we're talking about $47,000 an ounce gold. Now, I don't even like to measure gold in dollars. If you measure it in a price, price doesn't mean anything. It's the value. How much can you buy with the proceeds? If we have deflation and some of this currency evaporates, because it's all just numbers that they type into a computer these days, if we have deflation, maybe gold peaks at $3,000 an ounce and the currency supply collapses to way down here somewhere, uh, and the Dow is at $1,500. That means gold will still be double the Dow. You're still going to get 14 times more paper assets one day than you can buy today with them. And it's probably only a couple of years left that this is going to take, as you saw by how the nails in the coffin of the dollar standard, how they're speeding up. Uh, if we have big inflation and the Dow goes to uh, 30,000, maybe gold will be 60,000 an ounce. And if we have hyperinflation, the Dow would be uh, uh, 30 trillion and gold would be 60 trillion. It doesn't matter in any case. Gold would buy you 14 times more paper assets than it does today. So <clears throat> these are the global assets. Here's the, the bond market. Here's the stock market. This is the value of real estate on the planet. And uh, these are bank deposits. And there's gold. Now, that little slice of the pie is going to get a lot bigger in just the next few years. And it's not going to do it by a whole bunch more gold just appearing. It's going to do it by the price of other assets going down, or at least their value going down, and the value of gold going up. So the price of gold will change. That piece of the pie is going to grow. It was a lot bigger back in 1980, when gold was at $850. It's going to get a lot bigger today again. But today, as you've seen, it requires far, far higher prices. So the death of the dollar standard. Do, how many people here believe that I'm sort of predicting what's going on in the future here? You can see that there's a new world monetary system coming. It happens every 30 to 40 years, except this time, instead of a baby step off of gold, we've got to go from nothing. The fundamental, fundamental driver of gold, it's not so much that gold's in a bull market, it's more the dollar's in a bear market. And people say, well, how high can gold go? And my answer is, well, how low can the dollar go? The answer is the dollar can go to zero. If you divide any number by zero, the answer is infinity. So gold can go to infinity if the dollar goes to zero. Now, in the real world, something else will happen. It's not that gold becomes worth infinite number of dollars. It's more the case that the dollar just falls off the stage. The dollar gets the hook, so to speak. And you, you, you'll count gold in dollars to 5,000 to 10,000 at some point, but there'll come a time when you won't count gold in dollars anymore because dollars won't count. People won't want dollars. There is so much opportunity in crisis. It is absolutely extraordinary. That's just not me saying that. That's just history. You read any amount of history, and I don't mean last week, I mean real history. You know, in times of crisis, it's when huge fortunes were made. In times of crisis, it's when human beings create and develop newest technologies and new science and new medicines. In times of crisis, there's so much opportunity, as long as you can remain calm, get educated, uh, be resourceful. The challenge for most people is that in crisis, they go into crisis mode, which means they go into scarcity, they go into lack, they go into blame and none of those emotions are resourceful for helping you solve whatever challenge is in front of you. I believe that this is probably the greatest opportunity of anyone's lifetime. There has never been a situation where all the, everything came together just like this. This is the first time in history where all the world's currencies are just fiat currencies backed by nothing. And if what, happen, what I think is going to happen, happens, this is the greatest wealth transfer in history. It's the greatest opportunity, and it'll never happen in our lifetimes again. So now we've learned the following hidden secrets of money. There is a global loss of confidence in the US dollar that is accelerating rapidly. The change to a new monetary system is inevitable and will most likely be chaotic. Gold standards do not work over long periods of time, but gold itself does. The public contributes to the massive amounts of currency creation by using credit cards and signing loans. Gold has already accounted for the expansion of U.S. dollars twice in the last century and may likely do so again. So that's it for this episode. 
I thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. I know I threw around a bunch of astronomical prices for gold someday in the future, but it isn't the price measured in dollars, it's how much is its value, what is it worth, how much stuff can it purchase. The price measured in dollars, or any currency for that matter, is just a bunch of numbers and it really doesn't mean anything. There are numbers that are created by the world's central banks, by the commercial bank system, and we're forced to transact in these currencies. But in our next episode, we're going to clear away the smoke screen of national currencies and show you how the world monetary system really works and how all national currencies have to continue losing value. It is not possible for them to maintain purchasing power over any reasonable period of time. As for the golden nails in the dollar's coffin, it's only been a short while since we filmed the presentation in Singapore and already there are more of them. So for an update, visit hiddensecretsofmoney.com and in your free information toolkit, there's an exclusive presentation on the latest developments of the golden nails in the dollar's coffin. Now I know this episode was kind of serious and it might have you upset right now, but believe me, it's not all doom and gloom. As I've said many, many times before, there are these brief moments in history where the safest asset class, the safe haven investment for the last 5,000 years, also becomes the asset class that has the greatest potential gains in purchasing power, and I have bet my life on it. First I became an investor back in 2002 and then I started telling everybody about it. I started warning them what was going to happen with the world economy and how to protect themselves and I made it my mission to educate as many as I could. So in 2005 I wrote my book and then I gave people a means to protect themselves and opened up goldsilver.com. I believe that my team and I have created the world's best precious metals dealership because we don't just sell gold and silver, we are gold and silver investors. And what we want to do is help you understand how to get through what is coming to protect yourself and to turn all of these bad things around to your benefit. So if you decide that precious metals are for you, please visit goldsilver.com. We'd love the opportunity to become your dealer because we feel that we are more than a dealer. We are a partner with you and we're on the same side of the fence as you. So thank you very much. Good luck. We'll see you at the exclusive presentation at HiddenSecretsOfMoney.com. Thanks. Do you think this is a man in the lifeboat situation? Let me ask you this. If you knew the Titanic was going to sink and you were on the Titanic, you know there's going to be a lifeboat situation coming up soon. Yeah, would you like... Enough life, lifeboats would, available. That's right. <laughs> would you like to get in the lifeboat early, get a nice seat, Maybe close to the water, maybe close to the, to the food supply, right there in the middle, nice and comfy. Or you want to be one of the last ones on the boat and you're jockeying for a position, you have to throw a kid out to make room for you. Yeah, so uh, you know, lifeboat situation, it depends how, what, how you like your accommodations on the lifeboat is whether you should be making your way towards it right now. And I would be edging my way towards it right now.